It has been a turbulent summer for France. In June, police shot dead a 17-year-old French boy of Moroccan and Algerian descent, Nahil Marzouk, inciting mass riots across the nation. A couple of months later, the French government announced that it would be placing a national ban on wearing the abaya, a full-length robe often worn by Muslim women in public schools, causing fury among the Muslim community. So is this latest ban a defense of secularism, as the government claims, or will it lead to more racial and religious discrimination? To discuss these developments, we're joined by French journalist and filmmaker Rokaya Diallo. Thank you so much for joining me up front. It's good to see Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I'm really glad. Absolutely. Let's, let's start with uh, what's going on on the ground. France's education minister, uh, Gabriel Attal, called wearing the abaya, quote, a religious gesture aimed at testing the resistance of the republic toward the secular sanctuary that school must be. This was a very controversial decision. Can you tell us about the kind of reasons and the timing for this decision? So to me, there are an official reason and an actual reason. So uh, initially, the principle of secularism in France was meant to be a principle of equality. And over the last decade, it's been a principle of prohibition targeting Muslims. And to me, it has to do with a long history of colonial control of uh, women's bodies. We can tie it back to the old colonial era, era in Algeria, where there was unveiling ceremonies that were organized by the wives of the colonial generals to unveil publicly Algerian women to make them seem uh, actually look Frencher. So actually, so the, unveiling, literally taking their yeah, veils off. off. Like there were posters uh, saying, aren't you more beautiful without the veil? And it was something that was going on in the late 50s. So that idea that you are Frencher if you look like uh, the traditional French women is something that didn't really appear only this summer. But, but, but you say that, that the origin of this, or at least the spirit of the law, mm -hmm. wasn't that. Of course, it was to get rid of the influence, the strong, strong influence of the Catholic uh, Church. It was, so the law was voted in 1905, and it was meant to separate the state from the church and to have the state being neutral and not recognizing officially any religion. So a law was voted 20 years ago to ban public signs, religious public signs in school. So the law says public, um, religious public signs, but the debate was uh, over the hijab. Mm. So the hijab was banned 20 years ago, and they now want to go further and further. And the thing is that you can't tell apart an abaya from a dress. So mm. how will you interpret what is an abaya and what is a dress? Now they would say, well, clearly the abaya is a visibly religious, at least associated garment, that when you see an abaya, you know that that person is Muslim. But what we've seen in schools is that many girls had dresses that they bought in H&M, in Zara, that were not actual abayas, but that, was in, that were interpreted as abayas, and they were banned from school because of that. And the only reason why it was seen as an abaya is because they were Who's not African it? or black. <laughs> right. From a Af North African origin or black. So it's like... You can have both, uh, like, two, women, two girls having the same dresses, but one is white and the other is not, and one will be uh, seen as wearing an abaya and the other not. So it's really enabling racial profiling. Absolutely. And that's what happened uh, after the, the return to school. According to one poll by the French Institute on Public Opinion, 81% of French people support the ban. Uh, other polls show, interestingly enough, that it's not just right-wing support here. Uh, in fact, the majority of two of France's left-wing party supporters, the, the Greens and France Insoumise, also support this ban in large numbers. Now, you're based in France, of course. Uh, the mass support, where's it coming from? Again, not just right-wing support, but... It's everyone. Yeah. Like, basically, like, the largest part of the population. I think it's both the result of... Uh, Islam and Islamophobic propaganda that has been going on for, for years, for decades. Like, there have been the ban uh, of um, the hijab and then the ban of the burkini, like the full length uh, swimsuits uh, uh, in, in, in beaches. And that has actually used the public opinion to just uh, accept the fact that um, Muslim women don't have a right to enjoy the public space. And it's to me, important to remind the fact that during the last presidential election last year, the National Rally, which is the far-right party, made it to the second round. It is the second political force in France. Uh, after the presidential election, during the parliamentary election, they had 89 MPs elected in the National Assembly, which is a lot. We, we have never seen that in history. So the far-right is being normalized. 
and the government is running after uh, that e the, 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 the votes of the people who believe in those, in those ideas. And to me, the normalization of the far right has made uh, the French population more eager to accept uh, racist ideologies. Many countries talk about color blindness, mm -hmm. uh, but France literally codifies this idea of, of color blindness by not even collecting data on race demographics. It's like race just doesn't exist. Exactly. How is that? Uh, play out in everyday life? How does that impact minorities? How does that impact social services? How does that shape how we think or respond to what's going on? So I understand that colorblindness is a, a very beautiful idea of universalism. And I understand why it's difficult in France to collect data because of the Holocaust. Because like the last time the government collected data, it was meant to uh, deport and exterminate thousands of, uh, thousand of uh, like hundreds of thousands of people who were Jews who were sent to the, the, the camps, uh, the concentration camps. So I understand why we are still not comfortable with the government having and collect such data. But the consequence of that is that um, the people from the National Assembly have voted to remove the, the word race from the constitution. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> because they say that it doesn't exist uh, as in biology, what, what I get, but it does exist as a social construct, construct and it does have has effect on our day-to-day -day life. So the consequence of that is that it's very difficult to speak about race in France. I do so, and I'm constantly accused of importing uh, an American lens uh, onto France and as uh, creating something that doesn't exist. So but That's so fascinating to me, particularly given if race is a, is a, is a social construct, they mm -hmm. say it's not rooted in biology, that's mm -hmm. an American then it would be just as not real in the United States, right? Do they actually not see the value in thinking or looking through a racial lens at all? No, I would say that it's racist because we're all the same. So I'm the one bringing up a topic that, is, that doesn't belong to France. And to me, it's a way of just not addressing a problem because France has been sentenced several times by the European Court of uh, Human Rights. It's been um, uh, the subject, the topic of reports from Amnesty International, from Human Rights Watch, because of racial pro profi uh, police profiling and racial police brutality. But there is no response. There is no official response from, the, from France because not addressing race, being colorblind, is also a way to get away with racism because you say it doesn't exist, so you don't do anything, even if we The fact that they all just look the same, all the people getting oppressed, all the people getting treated poorly at schools, all the people getting shot by the police, the fact that they all look this way and not that way is just coincidence. Yes, and you speak about race in discursive ways, you see? When you, know, you use the secularism to ban abaya, it's obviously racist, but you say, no, it's our tradition, it's secularism, and it's not, you know, it's not for Muslims, it's anyone who would have a religious sign, but it happens that only Muslims have very visible religious signs. And actually, um, yes, that's, that's, the, um, that's the, the way of speaking about, about race without really speaking about it. As you pointed out, many in France look at the work of intellectuals like yourself and they say you're importing American or Anglo-Saxon identity politics that don't actually exist in France. Uh, President Macron has even echoed this idea. Uh, in 2020, he warned that French intellectuals have yielded to, quote, Anglo-Saxon traditions based on a different history, a history that he claims is not ours. Uh, how do you respond to this? I say that uh, Franz Fanon, who inspired uh, black Americans, was French, and uh, that France is the only country to be present on four continents. So you have the European part of France, but you also have the Caribbean territories, uh, Guadeloupe, Martinique, but also some parts in the Indian Ocean, which is the Réunion Island, and Mayotte, also some parts in the French Polynesia, Tahiti, New uh, Caledonia. So that is the result of past and current colonial uh, politics, and um, I think that I try to um, to, to to quote uh, French uh, examples and to be inspired by French intellectuals because those people, Franz, uh, Franz Fanon, for example, are ignored, ignored mm. by the public sphere. Like if, if you go to France and you have a place that would commemorate or celebrate someone who fought against racism, you will find a train station named after Rosa Parks. You will find a park named after Martin Luther King. You will never find someone French having a place honoring their work against racism. So that's also another way to say, yes, it's a problem that, that we care about, but it's an American problem. So we will rather honor uh, you know, 
Nelson Mandela, who's uh, South African, or Martin Luther King, than, you know, Franz Fanon or Aimé Césaire, even Aimé Césaire has recently had finally uh, a metro station, but it's still very, very, it's taking a long time. Rokaya Diallo, thanks so much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, that is our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.